Welcome to People Tech, the podcast of the HCM Technology Report. I'm Mark Pfeffer. This edition of People Tech is brought to you by HCM Unlocked, experts who support, build, fix, or overhaul your HCM technology or strategy. They focus on HCM tech so you can focus on your business. Learn more at www.hcmunlocked.com. I'm talking today with John Wallace, the CEO of HCM Unlocked. We're talking about the HCM environment and how it's changing in this world of COVID-19, and also some of the best practices involved in leveraging HR technology for a business advantage. John, thanks for being here. Let's start by talking about the HCM environment. What changes are you seeing right now in HCM technology, and what proportion of those changes are driven by COVID-19 and what changes were already underway? Yeah, I think it's a great question. Um, there, there were certainly a number of changes that were already occurring prior to COVID. COVID has certainly accelerated it. So what we're seeing is it's really a shift beyond core HCM functionality. So core being you know, payroll, time and attendance, HR management. And we're seeing more of a shift towards talent management. So it's really functions that are used to manage employee, especially with those employees being virtual. So if you think about talent management, as we move to an environment where you're no longer restricted to the restraints of where's my geographic headquarters, you can tap into a wider talent pool. So companies are looking to purchase implement the software to help them do that. They're also looking at LMS platforms. How do I train a staff that is not on premise. They're looking at increased self-service functionalities. Again, I can't walk down the hallway and and help a new hire on board. We're going to rely more on technology to do that. So I think some of those changes were already occurring, but with the massive swing to the virtual environment, it's really being accelerated. One of the things I've noticed is a, a lot of vendors in the space are adding different features like, you know, video messaging or video conferencing all of them geared toward the remote workforce, but a lot of them feeling kind of bolted on. Do you think that HCM vendors in general are really rethinking how work is getting done and and thinking about changing their approaches to to align with it? Yeah, I think you have to. I think you have to have that thought process because some of these changes are not going away. So it's the incorporation, like you said, of more video. And really it's a more fluid process as you onboard and bring an employee on. Um, It it also leads to really the, the need for better integration. So looking at this as more of an HCM ecosystem, saying how can I play with some of the best in breed technologies, put them together, in a process that makes sense for employees and it's it's easy to use for administrators. So there's more of an onus today on incorporating technologies, making sure it's a fluid and comfortable experience and that you still have that personal touch from a virtual standpoint. In general, what HR technology trends are you seeing even, you know, above and beyond that, you know, what's working or, or what's not working? So we're seeing businesses start by, you know, kind of taking stock of, what they have. So oftentimes before you go to the market and say, hey, I need this solution, you may already be paying for it. So as an organization, we did something pretty similar. So we used Microsoft for our email and we were also using Zoom for our video calls and it wasn't until our operations team said, hey, why are we paying for Zoom? We have Microsoft Teams. Why don't we just implement that and make the switch? So organizations are doing the same thing with their HCM technology. So once they identify what they have and what they don't have, there's optimization. So how do we get our current tech to work as it should? And again, this is today, it's, it's very important when you have a virtual workforce, you need technology that works. And so when you're looking at a situation today where there's a need to optimize and there are gaps in the market that's identified or gaps in your technology is identified, the next question becomes, how do I fill that gap? There's been a rise in some of the leading vendors in their marketplace working with best in breed solutions. And what that leads to is really it's a rise in a need for integrations. So we have a team of software developers and I can tell you on almost a daily basis, we're getting asked, does this technology integrate with that technology? You know, what, what does, 
know, can we build this API? And, and, and it's new and it's different. And again, it's, that's just exponentially increasing as organizations are taking stock of what they have and then actively looking to plug those gaps. Now, when you're doing this kind of implementation and, and integration uh, is a big part of it also, what, what makes it also difficult, especially when it comes to HCM technology? Yeah, I think that's a great question. And that's, that's one that we get all the time. And I think it starts with having just the right perspective of what needs to happen in an implementation. So it's really, it's a combination of its capacity and know-how. So do you have the staff currently, if you're an organization that really understands payroll and HR, but they also understand the technology. So you, you gotta have the know-how. It's not just about payroll and HR, it's about payroll and HR technology as well. Then you have the capacity to do so. So if you don't have the time, it's not going to happen. I may be really handy around my house and you can give me a ton of free time, but just because I'm handy around my house doesn't mean I can build a house from scratch. It's a completely different skill set. I think organizations today in the HCM space are starting to tap in to those specialists to help in that process. And I don't think this is something new. Oracle, SAP, Microsoft, they've been using third-party implementers, for example, for, for decades now. And it comes down to just understanding, does my team have the capacity? Do they have the know-how? And when we get into a situation as a company, and again, we help organizations to, to build their HCM software, to optimize, to utilize their HCM software, you know, what we're looking at is kind of a multi-phased approach. So the first is design. So sometimes companies just, they don't know what they don't know. So what can we get the system to do? We've got an ideal for a you know, workflow for onboarding an employee. How do we build that? So that's kind of the first step is what does design look like? And oftentimes companies need help with figuring out what are my design options? The second piece, and I think this might be the most difficult piece of an implementation, is the data migration. So how do you properly get the data from your existing system into your new system? And then during that blackout period, during the data conversion, how do you main, maintain two systems at the same time, especially if you're not as trained in your new system that you're purchasing? Mm -hmm. So we identified that as a massive challenge. And what we did, because we already had these fantastic developers as part of our team is we built and it's proprietary to us a data validation tool that takes what does the current system data points look like what does a new system look like and it cross compares in addition to that it's also a smart tool so if i have a social security number for example if it says abc in system one and abc in system two yeah it matches but we know that abc is not a relevant character for a social security number so I think that's incredibly important. So in the, in the current environment today, data validation is an art when it should be a science. Anything data-driven should be scientific. And what's happening is companies are essentially downloading Excel documents, they're doing V lookups, and they're just spot comparing different sections to see if the data transferred over correctly. And the problem with that is if you don't catch a mistake, you might not see the ramifications for that for a couple months. And it really could be a ticking time bomb. So if you look at the statistics, Sherm states that 70% of HR managers would consider their HCM implementation a failure. I think the data is probably one of the biggest reasons why. Mm -hmm. And then finally, what, what makes this process so difficult, final important piece is the proper deployment of the technology. So an HCM system, especially if it's new, is not going to work effectively if all end users don't know how to use it. So we're talking about really hands-on training beyond just the administrators. So do the employees and the managers understand how to use their technology? And if you don't figure out a way to train everyone, there's going to be problems. And I think that's going to lead to the perception that we had a failed rollout. It must be made even more difficult by the fact that the HCM technology tends to hit every part of the company. That's a really great point is that, you know, it's not like this system sits with just accounting or you know, just sales or just marketing or just finance. It's a fact that every employee is going to use a system and they're going to use it in a different capacity. So you can't just do a blanket rollout, a blanket training. Everyone uses it a little bit differently depending on their role and function within the organization. Can you talk about the ASO model? What 
is it? How does it work? How do you use it? In simplest terms, the ASO model is technology plus people support. So it's having skilled, specialized labor to help drive and utilize your technology. And, and what's, where is it now in terms of adoption by employers and where do you think it's going? So this is a perfect example of a trend that is significantly accelerating because of COVID. Now we, we already saw an increase in a buyer's appetite for the ASO model, but organizations today are starting to see that it really makes a ton of sense for them to upskill their labor around utilizing HCM technology and significantly drive down their fixed labor costs. So with the increased acceptance of a virtual workforce model, I personally believe that the traditional way to staff your payroll department with W-2 employees is obsolete. I'm not saying that there won't be uh, one or two payroll HR people. And of course it differs depending on the, the size of your organization. But if we're focusing on the mid market, I really think that businesses are gonna want to strategically approach this, upskill their staff and significantly drive down their fixed labor costs by tapping into a specialized workforce model that is the ASO model. There really is no benefit of having a full-time employee or employees driving that software. Would you, you can get experts to do it at a fraction of the cost. In the HR world, I can hear people saying, or asking what's the difference between an ASO model and say a PEO. Could you explain that? Sure, I mean, the big difference there is that the PEO is going to add the insurance line. So whether it's a workers comp or, or health insurance, whereas the ASO is just technology people. So if the, PEO, if the ASO is technology plus people, the PEO is technology plus people plus insurance. And I'm not advocating that we don't need an HR team, but I think you do but it, it's, it's about strategic HR. So if you look at Amazon, for example, if anyone's received a package from Amazon, the person who delivered that package and the fleet of delivery trucks, those are not Amazon employees. That function's very important to the business, but those are not employees. Now, does it mean that you outsource the strategic functions of what's Amazon's growth initiatives and their vision for the future but there are certain tactical components within payroll and HR that really don't make sense to keep in-house. What do you think the future of the model is, given all that's going on in the world right now? That massive growth. I, I really do. I think if we were to look at this you know, two, three years from now, uh, this is the way to do business if you want to be cutting edge and want that competitive advantage over your peers, tapping into more skilled labor, driving down fixed costs, making better decisions because you have optimized and fully rolled out HCM technology. As you mentioned, labor drives a business. So having technology that is fully built out and operating smoothly and producing you data that you can act on and make the right decisions again, two to three years from now, I think the ASO model is the norm. Well, thank you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Mark. That was John Wallace, CEO of HCM Unlocked. And this has been People Tech from the HCM Technology Report. Brought to you by HCM Unlocked. They focus on HCM technology so you can focus on your business. Learn more at www.hcmunlocked.com. And to keep up with HR technology, visit the HCM Technology Report every day. We're the most trusted source of news in the HR tech industry. Find us at www.hcmtechnologyreport.com. I'm Mark Pfeffer. Faith in the news media has been challenged, making it even harder to get stories told. The Friday Reporter podcast was created to help audiences better understand the media by hosting journalists who will answer the questions to which we need answers. Join me every Friday to hear more. Welcome to Don't Retire, Graduate, the podcast that asks you what you want to be when you grow up so you can graduate into retirement with a purpose and a passion, whether you're 25, 85, or any age in between. Gain actionable financial and mindset tips from your favorite authors, 
podcasters, and influencers to help you reach that exciting next chapter. Listen now and start building your path to financial freedom and reframing what retirement can mean to you. This is your host, Eric Brotman, reminding you, don't retire, graduate.